holds them responsible for not doing it. Because they ought to see it and ought to do it. And therefore, they're responsible for not coming to that conclusion. And here is the proof that they ought to be doing it because every step is valid, the conclusion is valid, every step is true, and the conclusion is valid. And so God holds them without excuse, Romans 1, 19 and 20. 3a. And this is due partly to the weakness of our intellect in judgment and partly to the admixture of images. Furthermore, with the many truths that are demonstrated, there sometimes is mingled something that is false, which is not demonstrated by... Uh, but that is false, which is not demonstrated, but rather asserted on the basis of some probable, rather than asserted on the basis of some probable and sophistical argument. That is why it was necessary that the unshakable certitude and pure truth concerning divine things should be presented to men by way of faith. Calvin says the same thing in Book One of the Institutes. It's almost a quote right out of Aquinas here. That's why that little book I mentioned to you on Voss, on Aquinas and Calvin, is the best thing in print now by a Reformed theologian. Because he said most people think of Calvin and Aquinas here, Calvin and Aquinas are really here. And uh, they're saying basically the same thing about faith and reason. B, noetic effects of sin, meaning effects of sin on the human mind. Three reasons for need of revelation of faith. The first reason is that God's truth be known sooner, for without faith a person would come to a knowledge about God only late in life, maybe too late. Second reason is that more people may have knowledge of God, dullness, daily necessities, and apathy hinder study, not for DTS students. Three, the third reason has to do with certitude. The mind of man falls far short when it comes to things of God. Look at the philosophers. Even in searching into questions about man, they have erred in many points and held contradictory views. To that end, therefore, that a knowledge of God, undoubted that should be, not uh, doubled, undoubted and secure might be pre present among men, it was necessary that divine things be taught by way of faith, spoken as it were by the word of God who cannot lie. You think Aquinas believed in inerrancy of uh, Scripture? He certainly did. So why do we need revelation? So people can know sooner, people can know uh, better, and so people can know with certitude. Otherwise, they're subject to the errors of philosophers. Add one. The searching of natural reason does not fill mankind's need to know even those divine realities which reason could prove. Belief in them is not, therefore, superfluous. For human reason is very deficient in things concerning God. Now, we ought to recite that out loud, uh, but I'll repeat it one more time. Aquinas said, human reason is very deficient in things concerning God. A sign of this is that philosophers, in their inquiry into human affairs by natural investigation, have fallen into many errors. Just look at the philosophers. Now he's t talking like Tertullian. Remember, can anything good uh, come out of... Uh, Athens. What has Athens to do with Jerusalem? Uh, you patriarch of all heresies, remember Tertullian said about philosophers. They fall into many errors and have disagreed among themselves. You show me two philosophers, and they've got at least three or four opinions between them. And consequently, in order that men might have a knowledge of God free of doubt and uncertainty, it was necessary for divine truths to be delivered to them by way of faith, being told to them, as it were, by God himself who cannot lie. Noetic effects of sin, grace needed. If for something to be in our power means that we can do it without the help of grace, then we are bound to many things that are not within our power without healing grace. For example, to love God or our neighbor. You can't do that without grace. There's no way you can love God or your neighbor. The same is true of believing in the articles of faith. No one can believe in the fundamentals of the faith without the grace of God. But with the help of grace, we do have this power. As Augustine says, to whomever this help is given by God, it is given in mercy. To whomever it is denied, it is denied in justice. Now he sounds like, yeah, here he sounds like a, a five-point Calvinist. God is only giving it to some and not to others. 
namely because of previous sin, even if only original sin, not necessarily sin in this life. If God withholds it, he's just. If he gives it, he's gracious. But you're not going to come to a knowledge of God without it. Now, one thing you cannot say of Aquinas is that he was an Arminian. He was some kind of uh, uh, Calvinist. In fact, I think uh, sometimes as I'm reading him that he's a stronger Calvinist than I am uh, because I'm not sure I would go as far as he goes. That statement right there gives me a little problems. Noetic effects of sin. Now, sin cannot destroy man's rationality altogether, for then he would no longer be capable of sin. Put a star, underline uh, this. There is the punchline. Why is it that in all of this, no matter how much efficacious, prevenient grace you get or need, you still have to have free choice? Because Sin cannot destroy man's rationality altogether, for then he would no longer be capable of sin. If you carry total depravity so far that the person is not capable of sinning, then total depravity has destroyed depravity totally. If the noetic effects of sin destroy man's ability to reason, and reason, being a rational creature, is a condition for moral responsibility, then total depravity has destroyed moral responsibility. Don't carry the doctrine of total depravity so far that the person is totally incapable of receiving, thinking, or willing. If they're totally incapable of thinking, reasoning, or willing, they're totally incapable of sinning. If they're totally incapable of sinning, you can't call them totally depraved. You can call them a beast, but you can't call them totally depraved human being. 